And your speaker tonight, your tour guide for the show, is Tanikia Worth. Tanikia creates multimedia visual art, paintings, drawings, fine art prints, and book art. She's an educator, art educator, cultural arts organizer, and scholar based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. <coughs> Excuse me. She earned her BA in English and Afro-American Studies from Howard University. And she also has an MA in Arts Management, which is dear to my heart. <laughs> and so welcome to meet you. And we also have other artists in the exhibition who are with us. Latoya Hobbs, who made the large piece behind you. Um, Stephanie Santana. She's on her way. She's on her way. <laughs> and Chloe Alexander. So welcome. <laughs> to do like a critical dialogue because that's the way in which we kind of converse. So we want to tell you about why we chose the specific um, printmakers and the different image storytelling. And within critical ethnographic research, there are two terms, emic and etic, that we continuously talk about. When we talk about emic, it is from the inside of the community perspective. And oftentimes when we're seeing in works of art, especially within the Western canon, it is told from an edit perspective from the outside of the community. So we want to show you the power of visual language from the ways in which black women are speaking, and we want to show you the visual language that coincides with it for experimental printmaking techniques. And I'm going to follow her. No. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to wrap around a bit and talk to you all about um, Althea Murphy and Price's work. So, also, you all can see you all can see the different narratives from the mouth um, of the different printmakers. So when you get a chance, if you're looking at the labels, thank you, Josh, <laughs> <laughs> for um, pulling the narratives and sticking down there, um, just in case you don't have the catalog in front of you. But when we are looking at um, Althea's work. She is using um, screen printing for both of these pieces and building it up by layers and then placing the ink color on top. But what is fantastic about the way that her storytelling navigates um, the material cultural objects, specifically for black girlhood, um, we look at the barat, which is very iconic um, for black women. Um, when we grew up, most of us have this story of running around the playground or the house, and we have a specific sound in our mind when we look at a pack of goodies. <laughs> <laughs> or so it sounds kind of like a, so we hear that when we're just like running around, running around, and we can remember those different stories that we had um, coinciding with that. So thinking about um, black girlhood, how we, um, are marked and how our bodies are marked in those spaces and how we adorn ourselves um, as well. And then we go over to the combs, okay? So we look at the ways in which we care for ourselves, the personal care, or how others have cared for us. So she specifically has them organized in a certain way. So when we're thinking about systems of organization and material cultural objects and the habits of being, then that's what she's signifying here. And then um, you, we have this specific comb that, um, have you all seen this comb before, Sal? What do you call it? Rat tail. Yes, rat tail. <laughs> so we, black women, black girls, we call this the rat tail comb. So that is an image storytelling um, that unless you were in the inside of the community, you would not have these subaltern stories to actually share with that. So this is the reason why whenever you're you know, creating labels or you're talking to artists, you must have the people who are connected to those stories at hand, sitting at those tables, 
with that so that you can have those stories that cannot be told from the outside of you, but only from the interior. What I was really excited about with working with Althea is um, I'm familiar with her work from graduate school and we both attended Purdue and she had um, left by the time I got there but we were able to connect um, during my time at Purdue. But she was again working with hair which was phenomenal. Her lithographs of hair are just incredibly beautiful but to see a switch from the hair to the tools um, that are used for hairstyles because it's, it's a form of identity and thinking about hair as an identity and how we get those identities and how we identify these tools in you know the home. I mean I walked up to this piece and I was like I have every single one of those. <laughs> in my, I mean I brought them with me. They're here with me. So I was really excited um, to see the progression in her work and how she's still addressing hair and identity and things like that. So we're going to go around the corner to the next piece. So now we have Paula Wilson's work. And then we, you can possibly look at this work and say, okay, well this is, how is this experimental, right? Because it's traditional black ink on the white paper, which is like, a staple uniform <laughs> within printmaking. But um, she uses, this is her matrix block. And what she typically does is she'll um, have a block that she, and then she'll cut it and collage it to make figurative pieces that are what we would call heroic, you know, if we're looking at the Western art canon. But what she did was she found the beauty in the very thing that she was going to make something and remix it into. And she decided that I'm going to keep this work as is, you know, as a work of art. So the process is the experimental, taking one piece, going and doing something else, and you were able to see this specific piece in other works. So that's the way we were talking about experimenting um, with those things, and then she just decided to show the matrix for this. And then within this piece, um, she uses the term crude divinity. <laughs> <laughs> So um, she looks at the black female's um, body. So when we think about um, Sarah Bartman, who a lot of people know as um, Venus Hottentot, and we think about the ways in which the body of a black woman has been objectified, um, if we're looking on the exterior, exterior standpoint, but interior, you know, we're just like, oh, girl, you know, you look nice. <laughs> and then she takes the moon, and which is um, um, iconic for the iconography of femininity. Um, so she calls those two things together, crew divinity. And one of the things that I look at for Paula is that she has this superpower, um, which we call dyslexia. So um, a lot of people would look at, at it as a disability, but it is her superpower within printmaking because she already sees in birth. Mm -hmm. So the ways in which she works, she uses that um, as a superpower versus um, as a disability. So um, I love the way that she does that. Um, I just became familiar with her work and it's so incredibly beautiful. Um, the moon, if you're familiar with my work, is a symbol that I use in my work a lot. Um, in terms of, of having a female presence in all in all of the work that I do, mm -hmm. and this I saw hair, I saw basket weaving, I you know I saw all of those references um, in these pieces. So I just kind of wanted to point that out. Then we're gonna go over to some abstraction. <laughs> interesting um, for black artists in general is that abstraction has taken the longest um, time to be canonized, I would say, um, for um, black artists. Lisa Hunt has chosen to stay within abstraction because what she wants people to understand is the energy that is involved with the process of moving. And so she connects spirit, self, um, within this. So she wants you to see the rhythm, the energy, things that are rooted in the African diaspora as well. So that you can feel those um, rhythmic sounds, um, looking at the waves, you can um, look at the different color usages 
um, too. And then she takes us to um, a black and white version, but you can still feel those vibrations and the rhythm even within the black and white. So she just wants to show you the juxtaposition um, with color, we have color, um, unisere graphite, mono print, and then she does immaculate gold weeping as well. Um, if you look at some of more of her work and weaving those rhythms together as well. And now we have the toy of pop ups. <laughs>
uh, within the work, but then she had the Morris Cole. Um, this is the Morris Cole here and there. And a chant that she can never get out of her head is what she heard in the 60s. And it's I Am Somebody um, by Jesse Jackson. So she decided to put that into Morris Cole when you're thinking about language and um, how it is coded and decoded. So she decided to use those within that book. So, and this piece is a, a scene of black interiority where there's an intimate conversation happening within the living room structure. And within the black home, the living room has become like a beacon of an intimate space that we were all able to feel comfortable in and talk about family dynamics, et cetera. This piece was in, taken, I believe in 1954 to 1960s. I can't recall, but it was in Terrell, Texas. And this is her uh, mom, aunt, and a great aunt um, in this piece. And they were smiling in front of the colored only, you know, bathrooms for that. Mm -hmm. So she's bringing um, this thing we call again about fractal time. She's talking about the past, the present, and the future, and seeing how we are able to piece things together. Um, that. Um, this is another piece. This is of her grandmother. And she's looking at the repeat pattern as an incantation. So six times. She also decided to use the color hate blue, which is if you are in the um, Gullah culture, or if you think about the South, that color is specifically used on porches to ward off unwanted spirits. So she decided to use that in a monoprint style in the background, and then the pinwheel uh, pattern as a form of protection. So these are all things as if she's um, remembering and casting spells of protection um, for the past. She's very into self-preservation and cultural preservation and how we can do that um, from the inside of our families first. This is Sam E. Vernon's work. And she has a love for bell piece. Um, I know. <laughs> And these are books that you get in touch and you know look at because this actually comes from a 26 print monoprint series that she does. And she's very interested in the ghost print. And specifically, usually um, it's not good enough, you know. <laughs> the ghost print isn't good enough. But what do we do? How can we elevate the ghost print, understanding that it's a point of rememory, right? So you have um, different uh, figures that are um, gender fluid that are imposed in here. Um, so she's using calligraph, monoprint, mixing those up, printing on Xerox, all those different things to see how many times can I uh, further the ghost. So um, that's um, Sam's work. And then we have Chloe here. <laughs> Um, so both of these pieces are self-portraits. I did, or it's something I'm, um, I've been thinking about a lot of my work for the past three or four years is probably um, this idea of influence. I think that's the best way to describe it. Um, how are our behaviors, how are um, our customs, how is society shaped by influence, seen and unseen, and how does it start at a very young age, and how does what influences you from the most formative years affect who you are as an adult. And so with these pieces, um, I did them at a residency at the Law Institute in Berkeley. I thought about black hair. And um, my relationship with my hair has shifted and come full circle from when I was a child. Um, I was a kid who had my hair braided in bows. I've never had a relaxer. Does anyone know what that means? Um, <laughs> me and my hair has always been in this natural state. It's never been permanently straightened with chemicals. Um, and just thinking about how from that going into high school that was majority white and wanting to press my hair all the time and coming back full circle to my natural state, how hair is very intimate and personal. And how as black women, the way we deal with our hair is very methodical. Um, this is something that every black woman has probably done, combing and braiding her hair out of the shower so it doesn't get tangled at night. So something that's very familiar. 
And with these pieces, I was reflecting on how, despite how methodical and careful we are with our hair, how we are devalued, particularly in the workplace, because of our appearance. Um, and how we are othered and categorized based on our appearance. And when you think about othering for something that you cannot change, it's not a societal othering, it's an existential othering. I can't change the texture of my hair because um, my DNA, which the P's are a reference to DNA and Mendel's P's and heredity, um, and how that's problematic. And so despite the fact that these are scenes that are familiar to every black woman, it's not her hair, it's her mother's hair, it's her sister's hair, it's her aunt's hair. It's something that um, seems kind of foreign to other people and something that, you know, if I were to wear my hair to work, it may be deemed inappropriate or against the dress code. Um, and then this one, not necessarily related to hair, but it relates to disposition. Oftentimes black women are told, you know, to fix your face or to watch your tone. Um, it's something we've all heard before. And so the title, uh, maybe people would like you if you smile more, is actually something someone told me at work when I was having issues with my coworkers. Um, and so it's just, both of these are kind of visual responses to this overarching idea of influence and in particular black hair and black women and their relationships with and I love that Chloe is doing a visual response after, you know? So when we're talking about fractal time again, we're talking about her remembering um, of these things and having a visual language. And then if you go up close and you see all the sparkles, it just automatically reminds me of all that glitter is in gold, you know? Mm -hmm. That um, saying um, of how um, you have to wear the mask and then what does it look like if you actually responded the way that you wanted to so that you're not deemed inappropriate, you know, as a black. You know, <laughs> a lot of people, I'll move here. A lot of people have been talking about um, pandemic projects because of um, working under COVID 19. But in my thinking, as a black woman, um, minoritized and in minoritized spaces, then every project that I have done has always been within a pandemic. So I'm thinking of the ways in which I care for myself and how I care for others because. The comb symbolizes, in the African tradition, you give the combs um, for celebrations and also like in time of mourning, like a breakup, right? But we're still finding ways to care 
for people within difficult times. So um, I decided to uh, reimagine these combs, taking the different hairstyles, um, past, present, future hairstyles, and reimagining those things for fantastical hair on that. And then I decided to pull in um, handwork, which people call women's work, you know. It's hard work, so I guess women do hard work. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, I'm from the Mississippi Delta, and I decided to think about G's Ben, these Southern women who have been working hard in many areas, including the tradition of quilting, and how they improvise with these works of art, and how there's a century history along with the G's Ben. So I wanted to pay homage, and I did hand quilting, um, for the collar um, on here. And then um, I kept everything black and white. I was thinking about um, Ruth Wadey, you know, who is, uh, who actually lived in um, Minnesota um, a long time ago. And she's now um, an ancestor. And she um, was very into the everyday. And she used black and white and mark making a lot. And over here, um, I did the same thing, um, and then all of the hand embroidery is by, you know, it's by hand, so I stitched all those pieces um, by myself, doing women's work. <laughs> no, <they're not. laughs> and um, that's, that's our show, Julia. <laughs>